Okay, another one of the treasures that Mr. Mickey brought down here, and I call him a treasure because to me it is, is this, was this a four by six? It's actually about a three by seven. A three by a seven extra. piece of walnut for a gun stock. Now there is a lot of walnut in this, but the thing about it is, guys, is that's like, to me, it's like a treasure because I, I'm going to make a walnut gun stock for a gun that my father let me hunt with when I was just like 10 or 12 years old, killed my first squirrel with. I have that gun now, but the stock is broke on it, and there's no replacing the stock. It has to be custom made because the gun is just so old. And to tell you how old it is, it's a 410, and the barrel on it is over an eighth of an inch thick. That's an old gun. It's an That's old back gun. when they made real guns. That's when it, it's yeah. not these little thin barrels like you get on that, yeah. like the youth models that's light and all this kind of stuff. It's a long. You can shoot that thing all day and still grab the barrel. Yes. And not be yeah, it's a, it's a long barrel. The gun is heavy. And the stock on it, it got broke, and I just, I have it. And I said, you know what, I want to make a stock. Well, Mr. Mickey had a piece of walnut that I was able to get from him. And this thing, I'm going to, actually, it's, I can make a several of them out of it, I believe, to be honest it's with you. It's a little bit gnarly, but I tried to capture, especially for, for walnut, the yeah. beautiful grain is called Cathedral. Okay. Um, on my channel later on i'll get into making some videos and explaining the different types of grains right but i tried to capture some of the cathedral in the edges of it so that that will blend in to me it looks better when it blends over across it and down on each side to i got kind you. of like the book mask but i mean of course everyone's different yeah but ideally when i saw that that's what i was trying to capture i wanted to try to capture the cathedral on the side and maybe some gnarly ground grain down the, the edge of it but it should turn out, you should be able to find at least at least one good one. Oh, I'm sure I'll find it in there. And this, it's an heirloom. When oh, exactly, done, it's, it's an heirloom. heirloom. See, I, can, I actually have enough to make the four stock and all that yeah, of it, too. I mean, I can actually make a flint log might, out of this one along with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. You might even find another project. I might even that. find another one with it. Um, the only thing I don't know, and I'll ask you about that here, is, you know, because of its width, I am going to have to cut it down because the stock is a lot thinner. How does it plane? So... If you, I didn't, I didn't know if you had a bandsaw or not. Oh, I have bandsaws, planers. Well, if you got, a, if you got an upright bandsaw, just run through that bandsaw. Okay. And I, and then you know, I will try to to plane about a good quarter of an inch. I leave that just yeah, so you can flip and keep getting the best right. result for it. But I wouldn't want to, you know, that's a lot to try to plane that. Yeah, does but it, you could. Does it plane? I mean, oh yeah, Lord, Lord yeah. As long as you got sharp blades, okay. sharp knives, uh, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. That's for, that was going to be one of my questions I was going to ask you about there is on and that. Just hand sand whenever you get to your curvatures oh, yeah. and all that, you know, kind of rough it up a little bit through your bandsaw. And, yeah, I got draw knives and stuff yeah. like I that. I can't I'll... tell you nothing about it. You know more about <laughs> than I do some of it. But, uh, but that's that would be my suggestion is yeah. cut it down within a half inch of your finished. Hello, everybody. It's Danny back from Deep South Homestead. Guys, we're back out here in the shop today. Uh, as I've told many of y'all, if you watch our videos on a regular basis, uh, Mr. Mickey from Hills Mill Homestead brought me some wood from my barn. And in doing so, I'd asked him, could he find me some walnut uh, to bring me? And he brought me a piece of walnut, a long board, about three inches wide by seven inches thick. I told him I wanted to make me a gun stock out of it. Now, the gun that I'm making it for is the one that's in my lap right here. This is a Model 37 Winchester steel built 410. Uh, it, this gun was my father's gun. Now this 410 is a little different than the newer Model 410s that you see. This is a long barrel on it and the barrel is real thick. It's like an eighth of an inch thick steel in this barrel. This gun's pretty heavy. My dad, there's a story that goes along with this gun. When Before my mom and my dad married, my dad loved to squirrel hunt. That was just one thing he loved to do. And he had bought a 22 rifle from a gentleman to squirrel hunt with. And he got up one day to go squirrel hunting, and his sister was sitting on the front porch. Well, as he walked out the house, the door kind of, back then the old screen doors on the house, slammed around and hit the butt of the gun. But when it did, the gun went off and went right beside her hair, right here in her head. 
and just barely missed her and went out through the yard out there. Well, that unnerved my father so bad that he took that gun right then and done away with it. He didn't want that gun anymore because it was just too dangerous to go off like that from just being bumped. He said it's a dangerous weapon and he just got rid of it. And he, what he done was he looked around and he found this old shotgun here from a gentleman that had it and he bought it from him. Now, my dad kept the gun for, I mean, my dad died at 86 years old and I just got it and he had it when he was just a young man. So I don't know the man he got it from. I don't know how old this gun actually is. But dad ended up, the stock got broke on it and kind of saddened my dad. So my dad had some cedar on the property there and he took a piece of cedar and he chopped it out with a hatchet and he made a stock for it. Well, being cedar is such a soft wood, after shooting it several times, it actually cracked up in here pretty bad on both sides up in here. And dad just... Dad being the man that he was back then, he just wrapped tape around everything to hold it in place. Now, there is a bolt that goes through this whole gun up in here, and it's actually bolted through the stock up here. But when I was at his house one day, I told him, I, I seen him out, he was squirrel hunting, and he came in, and I looked, and my dad was a big, tall man. He was all man. And I told him I, I was a shooter for nine years, and I, I looked at my dad while he was holding that gun. I said, Dad, pick that gun up and put it to your shoulder just a minute. Well, he did, and I told him, I said, Dad, the stock is like two or three inches too short for you. I mean, I, I knew about guns and gun stocks from, from being a shooter, and I told him, I said, look, we went over and we made another piece to go on the end of it right here to extend the stock on down for him out of some cedar that he had left over. And he put it up to his shoulder and he said, son, I'll tell you what, I just, it's amazing how much different that gun feels. And I told him, I said, dad, a gun is just like you always taught me about the equipment and the hose and the stuff we use in the gardens out there, how that every piece of equipment needs to be tailored to fit you. I said, when you made that stock, you should have made it to fit you. And he said, son, I never thought about that. He said, you buy a gun, they all just got gun stocks on them. He said, I just kind of patterned it after one of my other gun stocks. And I couldn't argue with that because when you go buy a, a shotgun or a rifle or anything like that, they have just a generic stock on them. Now, me being a shooter, my stocks were custom built for me. And when I make a stock for this gun, I will custom build that stock to fit my body. Uh, my stocks usually always had to have a little bit of a twist put in them when they were made, just simply because when I pick up a weapon and I put it against my head like that, I don't like to lean my head way over like this uh, because it impairs a person's ability to be accurate. I like to throw up and have it, right? I don't want to be moving my head when I pick a gun up. If you go up like this and you have to go down like that, that's not right. You want to, when you pick it up, you want it to automatically just be right where you're at. And this stock, when I make it, now this one doesn't fit me at all. I mean, literally, when I look down the barrel, the gun is sitting here twisted to my right because of how I am. My stock will have to be twisted just a little bit in order for the gun to sit perpendicular with the ground down here. So we'll have to do a little custom work with that. Now, the, now the length of it is pretty fair. It, it fits me pretty good right here. Now, I could probably do with it being just a little bit longer for me because my arms are a little longer. And I think I will probably make it just a touch longer right up in this area right here. I'll probably do that and it, because of the way my hand fits here. It, uh, when I put my finger on the trigger, it fits kind of decently, but I would rather it be just a little bit further up because what happens is, see right here? This thing right here, when you have this gun um, cocked back, now let me, okay, we're empty. When you pull this hammer back, like that to lock it. See, your finger, this part of your hand is against that hammer right there. And where I'm sitting here for my finger to fit this comfortably, I'm like this right here. And that's no good because when you squeeze that, it's just, it's in the way of my hand here. My hand needs to be back like this from it so I can just take my finger and cock it and be able to, 
to do it that way. So we'll, we'll extend this here a little bit from what it normally would be. Now, when you're looking at the barrel of this gun and the, and the whole gun right in here, it looks kind of shiny. What happened? My dad, he just, he, dad lived in an old house and he always kept the gun just sitting up on a gun rack. And those old houses, they didn't have any, uh, they didn't have any insulation in them. And, and my dad come in there one day and realized after he'd been sitting up on the gun rack for a year, it was all rusted up. The bluing on the barrel had just gotten rusted and everything because he'd been touching it with his hands like this, hunting with it and out in the rain and the, and the you know, the dampness and everything. And he took up some steel wool and he began to clean it up and he got it kind of halfway decent, but I'm going to have to finish trying to refinish this gun and get some of these rust pits out of it and everything. And then probably have to get a bluing kit. Now they make a couple different ways you can blue a gun. I'm probably going to have to re-blue it myself before I actually put the stock on it. And I'll go ahead and put the stock on it and make sure it fits and everything, but I'll probably have to take it back off to uh to re-blue it and beings i'm going to be making this out of the walnut i'm probably going to make another forearm piece for it right here to match the stock that i put on it so that it's all one matching piece of weaponry here and i'll go through all the mechanisms in the gun in here i'll take all the pins out of it and everything and look at it and because i'm sure after all the years of shooting this gun this little lip right here is wore pretty bad on that for it ejects the shells out. So I'm pretty sure that that's going to have to be uh, built up and fixed. And one of the things I wanted to show you was, see the end of this barrel here? Look how thick the end of that barrel is. I've got several other 410s that are newer ones, and that barrel is almost paper thin on the end. This one here is over an eighth of an inch thick. It's close to three sixteenths of an inch thick on the end and it's that way down through the length of this whole barrel and i'm pretty sure that's probably the only reason the gun's lasted as long as it has and uh and not just rusted through or something other but but this guy's is the is the gun y'all asked to be able to see the gun and it's an old antique uh it will still shoot but it needs some work done to it and we're going to start today on this right here this is a piece of the uh, walnut that I cut off that Mr. Mickey had brought me. And now what I had to do was, this thing was like three inches thick up here. And that was just way too thick for a gun stock. So what I had to do was run it through the table saw one way, run it through the table saw the other way. And it didn't reach all the way through it. So I had to take a sawzall. And I had to sawzall it all the way through the middle here in order to be able to get this thing down to a comfortable distance to where I can actually take it up here to the bandsaw and start roughing it out. So I took and laid that stock on here and I marked it out so I can get a rough, you know, kind of a rough feel of the stock that's on the gun because it does, uh, it does fit me fairly decent. It just needs to be longer. So I've got this part up here a little bit longer and we're just going to let this run out up here wild and I'll trim all that back and cut it back later. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take the bandsaw. Now, I've made this just a little bit wider than the actual gun stock itself, and I'm going to cut outside the lines just a little bit because this is still fairly green. Uh, even though it's dried a pretty good bit, I noticed when I cut it that there's still a lot of moisture in it. So what I want to do is I want to cut this gun stock, rough cut it out with the bandsaw, and just let it set because it'll dry out a lot faster if I can get some of this wood off of it. Because I don't know, uh, I don't know if this is going to twist. I don't know if it's going to crack. I don't know any of that stuff that's going to happen. And before I go and put a lot of work into this piece of wood and start cutting this stock out, I want to make sure that it is stable wood before I go through all that trouble. Now, Mr. Mickey spent a good bit of time doing what's called making sure there's cathedral in this wood based on the grains on the top here. And that is, I don't know how to explain it right here, but that's so that the grains are all facing upward in it like this. You get a you get a better look on a stock on the sides where, you, where you've got the contour of the wood like this. And when you're looking down the top of it up here, you see that the grains, the edges of the grain rather than the flat part of the wood up here. 
So I appreciate him for taking the time and doing that. Look at the color. Oh my goodness. Isn't that gorgeous? My daddy would freak out. <laughs> that is beautiful. Thank you, Mickey. Mill's Mill. He did a good job cutting this out. This is a walnut. Walnut. Now, this is only the first coat. I know, but look. It's making It'll, uh, it gorgeous. Look at all the color in it. It's the way he cut the wood. You cut it a specific way for... Gun stocks. For gun stocks. And then we're going to let it dry. And we're going to sand it. Look how pretty. That is beautiful. You won't see the actual beauty of it till that about that third coat after I've sanded it a couple of times. It dries and I sand it. I forgot what cut he called this. He called it a specific cut. To... I'll have to ask Mr. Mickey when he gets here. It wasn't quarter sawed, it was something else. It... This is going to be beautiful collector's item, huh? Well, I made the stock to fit me. Well, that is gorgeous. I mean, look at that. Well, good morning everybody. It's Danny back from Deep South Homestead. Guys, we over here at the cabin this morning. It's pretty chilly outside, so we thought this would be a good time to make a particular video we've been working on for probably, oh my word, good six months or a little bit more. Uh, let me take you back to a time that we've been the mid to late 1960s 
Uh, I was a young kid then. Uh, my father uh, come to me one day and he said, Son, you begin, you're getting of age now where I believe it's time I start taking you hunting. And, of course, you got to understand, back in that era, when a father looked at a small boy and told him, said, Son, it's time we start going hunting together, it was like the magic of being a young boy. You know, and the world today is different than that, but back then, it was just like something magic happened. And then I was just like ecstatic. I was like, yes! You know, I said, I, I was just jumping up and down for joy and everything, and my dad told me, he says, now, I've got you your first hunting vest. Uh, I still have it today. Uh, he gave it to me, and uh, he told me, he said, now, I want you to uh, put this thing on and tell me what you think. And, and I put it on, and of course, it was a little big for me because he didn't make them for small kids back then, but, it, but I, I thought it was, you know, I zipped it up in the front and had a place to put all your little shotgun shells and had a bag on the back for your squirrels and your rabbits or your pheasants or your birds or whatever. And man, I was just like, yes, yes. I said, this is beautiful. You know, this is great, Daddy. And uh, he said, well, he said, um, when I come home from work this evening, he said, we're going to start taking a few evenings this week and get you familiar with the shotgun. And I told him, I, I was like on cloud 10. You know, it was every little boy's dream. Well, when dad come home from work, he, uh, he come and got me and we went out behind the house and to the pasture back there and he set up some old piece of cardboard and, and he backed me off about 20 steps and, uh, he broke out an old 410. He said, son, I had this 410 for years and years. And he said, uh, I want you to, I want you to use this to go squirrel hunt with. Now guys, the 410 I'm talking about is not like the 410s you buy today. Uh, I have a youth model 410 at the house. Uh, I bought to have for my children and, uh, for my grandkids if they ever need it when they want to come here or something. It's real light, real little, you know, short barrel and everything and short stock and all. But my dad just had the old Model 37 Winchester 410. Big old heavy iron barrel, you know. And then I picked it up. I could barely hold it up to shoot it. And man, it seemed like when I pulled the trigger on it, it like almost knocked me down, you know. And, and he said, well, he said, son, he said, you got to grip it tighter. You got to hang on to it a lot tighter than that. And so he showed me how to flip the lever to the side, break it down, and there's an old single shot, and pop the shell out, and we put another in. And we were shooting number sixes. Back then, that's about what everybody shot for squirrels. You didn't have too many number sevens and eights and all those other shots. You just had number sixes, and you had a buck shot for it. So I fired off three or four rounds there, and he t after about the second round or third round, he told me, he says, I think you're about to get the hang of it. He said, we're going to give your shoulder a little time. He said, we're not going to shoot it too much because we don't want to get your shoulder all messed up. But he said, tomorrow evening, we'll do it again and see how it works. And of course, the next evening, I was all excited, and we got out there, and I shot, and it hurt, but he said, he said, how's that shoulder? I was like, it's doing good, Daddy. It's doing good. And it, it hurt like heck, you know, but... Uh, I hit really, really good those that next evening because I learned he'd show me how to hold it and how to stand and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he showed me all the safety thing. He went over all the safety stuff with me and everything about leaving the gun breached open. And uh, you know, when we see a squirrel, we put a shell in it, or uh, until we get more used to it. He said, then when we get more used to it, he said we'll just go ahead and put a shell in it and leave it closed. We just won't pull the hammer back until, you know, once you get a little more advanced. And, and that's how we done. And guys, we went squirrel hunting that first morning. <clears throat> and you know, the weather, when I was a kid, is a lot different than it is now. And it looks like we're going back into a phase where weather is becoming more like it was when I was a child, temperature-wise. Uh, in the deep south here, October 1st, we always had a frost. I mean, there was a frost. You could count on it because squirrel season started October the 1st 
and they was a frost. Uh, we had the fair in late September, and you always went to the fair. You was all bundled up at night because it was cold. And, uh, so I was always anxious right after the fair. We knew squirrel season was coming. So October the 1st, it was a, it come on a Saturday, my daddy got me up about 4.30 in the morning. He said, come on, son. He said, let's get dressed. He said, we get to get ready to head out. And of course, now you got to understand, my daddy's one of the older type men. When we left out, I thought we was headed to the woods. No, we headed to a cafe because my daddy grew up going to cafes. And so we went by a cafe and he got him a cup of coffee and uh, he got me a, a little... Uh, orange juice and something to eat. And, uh, we stayed there for maybe, I don't know, probably till about 5.30 and we hit the road and got out. We didn't have to go far because my daddy would call. And see, this is the beauty of life back then. There was no such thing as hunting clubs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad just made a few phone calls to some people and Asked him, he knew they had a bunch of land, and he told him, says, look, I want to take my son squirrel hunting for the first time. And, and he's like, Mr. Robert, bring that boy on, take him back in them woods back there, and don't you think anything about it? Y'all get you a mess of squirrels, he's in, or maybe a rabbit, or, you know, or anything else you want, to be honest with you. Because back then, I know there were laws and stuff like this, but the old people back then, they knew you weren't out poaching and trying to destroy something. They'd just tell you, just take what you needed, you know? And we'd light out, and Daddy didn't have to go far. Uh, we'd come up on some old property that, you know, uh, people back then owned big farms and stuff and big pieces of property. And they didn't mind if you called and asked about going hunting on their property. They didn't. Most of them were, were thrilled to death that a father was taking his son hunting for the first time. And they just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And so Daddy took me into the woods, and there was an old dairy barn back in the woods. There is an old abandoned dairy barn. I'll never forget it. Uh, we were kind of like easing along. He was showing me. He, he'd tell me, say, son, pick your feet up when you walk. Don't drag them feet when you walk in the woods. And I was like, yes, sir. And boy, I was picking my feet up like a soldier, you know, walking through the woods and trying to be quiet. You couldn't even hear my daddy walking in the woods. And I, I sound like somebody dragging a bicycle, you know. And, and he was trying to teach me how to walk with my feet and all. And finally I got where I could do it and I could do it really good. And uh, we were easing along there and all of a sudden he said, look yonder, son. Look at that old dogwood tree sitting there in the woods and squirrel sitting there on the limb, one of the limbs on it about five foot off the ground. Uh, eating dogwood berries. He said, look at him, young son. He said, get your gun ready. Let's see if we can't get this one. And I eased around where I could get up beside a tree and I picked the old 410 up there and I laid back and squeezed the trigger and boy, it knocked me back. I, di I didn't even see if I hit him or what, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, my dad patted me on the shoulder and he said, son, he said, good job. He said, go get him. And I, I ran over to the tree, you know, and I got there and here laid this big old boar squirrel just laying there on the ground and I picked him up while I was looking at him my hands were trembling and shaking and I was like I come walking back I said I did it dad I said I got him and he said yeah he said you did a really good job on him and he said now put him in that sack on your back there so I put him in the old hunting sack on my back and we meandered around through the woods there and my dad shot one and he let me shoot another one and then he'd shoot one I'd shoot one and I had the only hunting sacks thing. And uh, see, your limit down here in the deep south is eight per person. And uh, we had, we was up to about eight of them there. And, and I was little, you know, and that old sack was heavy on my back. I was leaning backwards with it. And I was like, I was like, Daddy, this thing's getting heavy. He said, well, if you're going to learn to hunt, son, he said, you might have to learn to tote the load, you know. And I was like, yes, sir. Well, I bought my shoulders up holding my gun and I was going down through the woods, you know. And, and man, I was getting so tired, I ain't gonna lie to you, but I wouldn't open my mouth. I was toting them squirrels in the back of that sack. And I think we ended up killing about eight to nine, something like that. And it got to be about 9.30 or something like that. He said, we better head on back to the truck. And we went on back to the truck and of course, dad would drop by the man's house and thanked him and asked him, did he want one of the squirrels, you know, in the, you know, the old man, he said, no, 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 no. He said, "Take y'all take them home, clean them, and 
have a good meal, you know. And, uh, so, guys, back then, that's how it was. You asked somebody to go on their property. Most of the older gentlemen would say yes. They knew you weren't there to destroy the land. You didn't leave. My dad told me, he said, son, don't ever leave garbage on anybody's property. Don't tear up their property. If you open a gate, shut it right behind you. Because most people had cattle and stuff like that. And I learned, I learned the rules of just being a good steward. And, and I never forgot that. Even to this day, if I want to go on somebody else's property to hunt or anything, I always ask permission. I don't never just walk in. I never just walk on somebody's property because it's just not good stewardship to do that. And uh, but that's a little bit about. Now we went hunting many, many times after that together. My dad never was a deer hunter. My dad loved to quail hunt and he loved to squirrel hunt. Now he didn't do a bunch of turkey hunting or nothing like that. Uh, as far as I know, my dad, all his years of his life, he never killed a deer. Uh, he just didn't see, he just didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't into the running dogs and all that kind of stuff, and he didn't see any need in it. Because uh, usually when people got out there doing that stuff, they were drinking, and, and, and Daddy just wasn't part of that kind of lifestyle. Uh, my dad was more of a by himself kind of guy. He just liked to slip around in the woods, take a few squirrels, come home, and, and we eat them, or rabbits. He liked rabbits, he liked to rabbit hunt like quail hunting a lot. And he would take and teach me in both of those with friends. And well, my daddy passed at 86 years old. And uh, we were going through my father's stuff and I told, my, I told my siblings, I said, there's only a couple things I want from my dad. Uh, my dad had two shotguns that he allowed me to use when I was younger. I said, that's the only two things I want. If, if, if I don't get anything else, that's all I want. And of course, I ended up with some other stuff, but uh, I managed to get those two guns. And my father's house, we found out, his old house that he lived in originally had had a leak right over the gun rack. And dad didn't hunt the last probably 15 years of his life. and. Those guns just sat on the gun rack in there. Well, the gun that I used as a kid had rusted all up because water had dripped on it. And, uh, and the stock had gotten broken and different things on it. And, uh, but I wanted it anyway. And, and guys, this past year, Mr. Mickey started bringing me from Hills Mill Homestead, started bringing me lumber down from my barn that I built, the Farm Hall Barn. And uh, I, I asked Mr. Mickey if he ever got any walnut in. And he said, yes, he did occasionally. And I said, well, I'd love to be able to purchase a piece from you to build me a gun stock out of. And he cut it a particular way and a particular width and thickness and all that for making a gun stock. Uh, because Mickey knows a lot about sawing wood and he cut this wood out for making a gun stock because it has to be cut a specific way. And he brought it down here to me, and guys, I I took the old gun stock off of the gun that was it was broken and sitting there flopping around on it, and I took it off and I kind of got the dimensions and the drawings off of it best I could, and uh, I started working with the walnut with a draw knife and a bandsaw and come real quick like to realize that walnut the grain can be going in one direction and all of a sudden it's just going in another direction. It's very difficult to work with, with a draw knife. But nevertheless, I kept working away at it, working away at it, until finally I got it roughed in. And once I got it roughed in, then I began the sanding and grinding process of uh, taking just a small amount of wood off at a time with my pocket knife, with grinders, sanders, files, working my way down because you see, I was a long distance shooter for many years and many of the weapons that I used, the stocks were custom made for me. Uh, because anytime you're really good at what you do, uh, you, you don't just buy a gun and from a store and, and it fits you, you know. Uh, all my stuff is custom made. 
and this stock would be no different because you see I broke my neck and uh, in the past and for me I can't lean my head over a certain way and take the jar from something because of my neck so as I begin to make the stock for this 410 I'm very tall my arms are very long uh, I made this stock a certain length this stock has a twist in it where it fits my shoulder perfectly my head doesn't have to lean over very far it's custom built to fit me Now I told Wanda I said now if I ever I have a youth 410 for the grandkids I said but if this gun was to ever be used by a young kid or anything you know the stock would have to be cut off and I shortened up a good bit because it's it's made for me. It's a custom built gun stock for me. Um, and guys, I would I would like to show you today. Now the gun is not completely finished uh, because it was rusted up. I've had to do lots and lots and lots of sanding on it, and I'm in the process now of trying to locate some three or four thousand grit emery cloth to be able to take it on down to its final point without taking the the writings off the barrel you know, like where it says model 37 winchester and three inch chamber and you know uh the patent and all that kind of stuff i want all that left on it without having to sand it down too far and the good thing is is it had not pitted or anything the gun barrel had not pitted it was just surface rust and whereas i was able to work it down a good bit and now i'm in the final processes of uh getting with a particular company and getting the right bluing agent to re-blue it and uh, to make it um, look brand new again. But it's a custom built stock and all on it out of walnut. And I want to share that with you today. I've got it laying right here. I'm going to try to get up closer to the camera uh, where you can actually get a good, a really good look at it. Um, it is a custom built stock now the butt plate on it i was going to use uh get the black plastic butt plate to go on it but i decided to make this one out of walnut also i made one and uh, of course i i pre-drilled the ends of it and uh put it in it and it uh this this old stock i mean it I, I wanted a nice finish on it and I got as good as I could get with this you know by hand doing something it's not machine done it's hand done but as you can see I spent a good bit of time on it Now I don't know if you'll be able to tell by looking at the end of the camera but this stock this this stock has a twist in it um, I know the camera's probably not going to do it justice but if you will look with the angle at the barrel and the angle of the stock the stock has a twist um, to the opposite side over there so that it fits me really well and it is a very long stock one that when I pick it up it fits my shoulder really well I don't have to lean my head over far um, it, it really fits me nice I, I, I didn't redo the uh, the forearm on it here uh, I was going to build a new one but this one was still in really good shape, so I, I basically took it all back down to the bare wood, refinished it, and it, uh, it worked out really good because it matches the stock pretty decent. I'm not sure if this is oak or ash or hickory or what it is, but it's a slight little bit difference in it <clears throat> um, than the stock. Now, in the future, I'm probably going to custom build this piece too. But right now, just to get the gun in working order, I, I just refinished it. Uh, but um, guys, this will be something that uh, hopefully, if no one ever, you know, if the country don't ever take them away or anything, it'll be an heirloom that I can pass down to, um, to my grandkids uh, to use. Now, I want to show you something else. I don't know if we can actually see this on the camera or not, but most gun stocks right here, they come off, and they turn way on down. If you'll notice this one comes and I stopped it right here and I raised it back up a little bit and made it longer right in here because I have large hands and when my hands reach around it I needed that little bit because there's a hammer right here that you pull back so that when you you know to for the center pin to hit the back of your shell and my hands are large and I didn't want 
that hammer being in the way, if you can see it there, of where the thin skin part is in your thumb here. So I, uh, I made that part in here a lot longer than they normally are on a gun. And the challenge came, now I'm not going to lie to you, the challenge came, you have to drill a hole from the center of this stock right here. There's a hole drilled from the center of this all the way through this stock. And it has to come out at an exact point up here. It's a, it's a 5 sixteenths hole up here down to right about here. And then from here out, it's a 3 quarter inch hole drilled. Because the head of the bolt that's in there, you have to have a bigger hole to get through here. And then you have to have a 5 sixteenths to go up in here. And it has to match the, uh, the threaded part inside the gun. Now that was probably my hardest challenge to do on this. Because you can make the perfect stock. And then when you go to drill it, if you drill it and mess it up, you might as well throw it away because it's no good to you. And Wanda told me, she said, I'm not going to mess with you. She come out and saw the stock and she's like, oh my word, Danny. She said, that is the most beautiful stock I've ever seen. And I said, well, I could mess it up if I mess up drilling. And she would not even come out when I was drilling it. She said, I don't want to be here to mess with I don't want to film it. I, don't want, I, I just want to leave you alone because I, I don't want you to mess this up. And the Lord was good to me. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time lining things up and getting the bits just right and everything, and was able to. Uh, I was able to drill it, and uh, and it actually came out perfect. It, it came out in the, the very perfect spot. Um. So guys, that's a little bit about the old 410. The only problem I've mentioned to y'all on some of the other videos is. I'm having problems getting shells for it. I can't, I've tried to order them. They won't even, we tried to give them our credit cards and stuff like that and they always decline so we can't ship to you. And, and I'm like, can't ship to your area, not to me, because <clears throat> we've ordered other shells before from other guns, but they can't ship to this location. And I, I just don't get it because 60 miles from here, uh, people are telling me they have, they have them in stores. And, and then I talked to the people here at the gun shops in my town, and they're like, good luck. You know, they said, if I had 100 boxes, I could sell 100 boxes of them today. I just can't get them. Now, they said, if I was a mind to drive somewhere, I could probably drive somewhere, you know, spend several hours driving somewhere and, and, and buy them, but I'm going to pay a high, high price per box. And then when I get back, by the time I figure my gas and my time and what I have to charge... I'm not going to make nothing, and people's not going to pay that. So that's where I'm at. Um, had, I've had a couple of people tell me that they're going to try to get me, where they live at, they've had some shells, and they'll try to get them, and when they come through this area, you know, if I, if I don't mind them coming by and visiting, then they'll drop them off. And, and, uh, and I, I told them, I said, I'll be more than happy to pay you for them. Uh, that, that ain't a problem. I would just like to have some. Um, so that I could hunt one more time with the old 410 that was my father's that I used when I was a child. So I don't know how old this gun was when my father traded for it. I know he was a young man at the time because he still lived at home with his mother and father. And... And my dad is 86, he died at 86 years old, and that's been several years ago. So this gun could very well be, uh, I haven't looked up the history of these guns or anything like that. It's a Model 37, steel built, it's called a, a Model 37 steel built, a uh, Winchester, um, 410, 3 inch chamber. I don't know the actual history of it. I haven't really taken time to look into it to see what the actual age of it is, but I'm pretty sure it's around 60 or 70 years old, more than likely. Um, but guys, I want to share this journey with you on my 410 and uh, how I made the stock and uh, some of the story behind the gun. 
And guys, these are the kind of things that is missing in our society today. There is no people to call anymore about going hunting. Everybody's worried about insurance and accidents and if you're not in a hunting club or a hunting lease or anything like that, you just don't have anywhere to go. And that's been one of the tragedies of the modern society today. And people, at 12 years old, my parents were letting me go squirrel hunting by myself in the woods with other, other guys my age. Today, most would not even give a 12-year-old a gun of any kind because they'd be scared to death somebody would shoot somebody. Yeah, we were, back then, we were taught rules, and we, we abided by those rules. We weren't careless. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to share this little bit of a journey of my life and one of my projects here at Deep South Homestead. Thank you guys from Deep South Homestead.